Good day. I'm John Fernandez. Welcome to eNewsline Live from AACSB's World Headquarters in Tampa, Florida. 2012 has often been called the year of the MOOC. It has been challenging for higher education to keep up with the many uh, developments with MOOCs. Um, for those unfamiliar with the term, uh, MOOCs are massive online open courses, uh, more affectionately known as the MOOC. They're large-scale courses delivered in an online uh, and open access format. Although their beginnings go back to 2010, MOOCs have made quite an impression on the academic community, including administrators, faculty, and students, as well as members of the business community. We are very pleased to have as our guest Michael Lennox, who's the Samuel L. Slover Research Professor of Business, as well as Associate Dean and Executive Director of the Batten Institute at the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. Mike also teaches a MOOC through Coursera, a major open online course developer, on the fundamentals of business strategy. His expertise is in the domain of technology strategy and policy with interest in the role of innovation and entrepreneurship for economic growth and firm competitiveness. Given Mike's experience and research interests, we are excited to have him here to discuss some of the latest technological disruptions in higher education, particularly the MOOCs, and what they mean for business schools and their stakeholders. Mike, welcome to ENL. Thank you very much. This is going to be an exciting day. I think we've got a, a wonderful uh, turnout. I know everybody's excited here at headquarters, and uh, uh, no pressure, but we're going to have a good time. Great. So, Mike, I, I would assume that many of our uh, viewers are familiar with MOOCs, uh, either from reading about their ever-evolving developments, uh, or perhaps from participating uh, or even delivering a MOOC course. Mm -hmm. Um, could you start with a brief definition of a MOOC and identify some of the most important elements? Uh, who are some of the major players also? So as you had mentioned previously, MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Courses. Uh, online courses have been around for decades, so really the distinction is the massive piece of this, that leveraging technology now to expand this out to, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of students to take a single, a single course. So uh, what I think characterizes these, the ability to reach that many students, are first and foremost, they're asynchronous. Uh, they revolve around content that can be consumed when they want to be consumed by the students. And of course, that they're scalable. Uh, things like video lectures and the like that can be viewed uh, by, once again, hundreds of thousands of students uh, efficiently. Uh, in terms of some of the major players, uh, probably the one who's gotten the most press has been Coursera. Uh, started by two Stanford computer science professors. Uh, Coursera has partnered with, uh, I believe, upwards of 30, 40 different universities and seems to increase every day, new partners that they have. Uh, other players are Udacity, uh, was started by Sebastian Thurn, who's an entrepreneur, Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Uh, edX, a uh, collaborative partnership between MIT and, uh, and Harvard, uh, has also invited other universities to participate in their program. Uh, other interesting players include Udemy, uh, one who I've actually partnered with and worked with in the past. And it seems like every day there is a, a new player on the block uh, offering a platform for online education. It seems like with that environment, the freedom of entry, uh, you wonder long term if there will be more central capital investment in a particular organization. You know, they'll outlive the others and, um, uh, and the industry will become less open and competitive. Do you think that's a, a risk? So, so putting on my business strategy professor hat, you know, one of the things that I study is uh, industry shakeouts and disruptions. And what we observe in industry after industry is that after their beginnings, there is often a uh, large number of influx of competitors within those industries that then eventually leads to a competitive shakeout. So uh, if you look at the history of the automobile industry or even uh, uh, digital music players, uh, they have this characteristic that we will get literally hundreds of players entering before the shakeout occurs. We're clearly in the very early stages of the kind of ed tech revolution with MOOCs. Uh, we're seeing that entry increase, like I said, every day. Uh, so one would suspect that there will be a shakeout at some point in time and we'll see a consolidation within the marketplace. Uh, how many players will be left standing? Hard to say at this point, but clearly probably less than what we'll see in the next 
you know, 12 to, to 12 months to 24 months uh, in, in this space. Um, I doubt we'll see kind of a winner-take-all market where there'll only be kind of one dominant player. I suspect there'll be enough opportunities for differentiation that we'll have a, at least a handful of major players in the, uh, the MOOC space. Well, for now, we have a lot of teams in the game. It makes it even more fun. Yeah. Uh, you yourself have experience in, in the MOOC world delivering the course, as we mentioned, uh, Foundations of Business Strategy. Uh, I was really impressed to read about that, so I'm anxious to hear your thoughts on it. But can you share with us how you became involved with MOOC delivery and the unique learning experience you had at the outset and, and how that's evolved? So, so my journey to the creation of this MOOC was perhaps unique. Um, I joined Darden in, uh, in 2008. Uh, and prior to that, I was on the faculty at, at Duke University at the Fuqua School of Business. Uh, as it happens, uh, they have different ways in which they deliver their, their residential courses at Duke. There are two-hour time slots versus hour-and-a-half time slots at Darden. Darden is a uh, pure case method school. A uh, vast majority of, of courses are delivered by the case method, Socratic exchanges from the students facilitated by the faculty member. Uh, at Duke, I also taught via the case method, but because of the two-hour time slot, I often ended the case discussions with about a half hour or so uh, lecture, uh, what I would call a debrief of the case discussion of that day. So when I moved on to Darden, I had built up over many years a set of lectures uh, that I would no longer use in the classroom in the Darden environment. So I had the idea of creating a city of, series of video lectures for our actual residential students uh, and was in the process of doing so when I was contacted by Udemy one of these platform providers and MOOCs. They had a project called the Faculty Project where they had reached out to 20 faculty to create online materials through their platform. So this was an opportunity of great synergy. I was already creating these video lectures. Udemy had approached me. I got approval from our dean and administration. And so we did the first MOOC of Foundations of Business Strategy, still available today on Udemy. Now Udemy's platform is a little different than Coursera and some of the others in that it is completely asynchronous. There's no beginning or end to the course. It's really a posting of a series of video lectures that you can consume at any time. Uh, and I've had about 15,000 students take that version of the course. Once again, logging on, taking the, uh, viewing the lectures at, at their leisure. There's no assessment, there's no certification uh, in that version of the course. Uh, probably about six months after we had posted with Udemy, uh, the Coursera opportunity presented itself. Uh, UVA became a partner with Coursera, the Darden School of Business became a partner with Coursera, and so I offered to transform my course into a Coursera uh, offering. Coursera is a little bit different in that it is a synchronous course with asynchronous materials. So my first course started on March 4th, it went for six weeks. Each week we released materials, uh, new lectures, uh, quizzes and the like. And then at the end of the course, there was a final project that led to a certificate of accomplishment if you uh, did everything required for receiving that certificate in the course. And so we're going to be offering the second version of that on September 2nd, once again, for six weeks. And what the synchronous uh, nature of the course allows you to do is have discussion forums that are uh, traveling at the same time. So students are simultaneously taking the course in lockstep and are able to use discussion forms. And even in many cases, we had students forming study groups, geographically based, based on where they were located, uh, to discuss the course, meeting in person and discuss the course. So that's what's one of the differences you see between some of these, some of these platforms. But as I mentioned, for me, it really started with creating materials for my residential students in the Darden MBA program that then led to having the opportunity to create uh, these MOOCs. Yeah, I, I read a comment that I believe you made, which I, I wonder what you think about this. Uh, the comment was that uh, you had taught five times the number of students in the history of Darden in this one six weeks course. Uh, that, that, that to me is just amazing. It was a lot of intrinsic reward, but it, kind of sets you aback. How can that be? I mean, the Darn School of Business is uh, a smaller business school, but uh, at the same time, we have uh, 50 years of existence, uh, and so literally thousands and thousands of graduates. But my first MOOC with Coursera, uh, at the high point, we had 90,000 students enrolled in, in the course. Uh, those are incredible numbers. The University of Virginia, I think, believe, I believe has about 200,000 living alumni over its entire history, going back, obviously, uh, centuries. Uh, so the numbers that you can impact in a MOOC is just quite amazing and phenomenal. And I have to say, 
probably the, the as an educator, the most uh, powerful part of the experience is seeing that uh, breadth of impact. Uh, we counted uh, upwards of 180 countries represented on those who enrolled in the course. And uh, I think even more exciting, out of those who finished the course, which was a much smaller number as we've seen through a lot of these MOOCs, uh, we had 120 different countries represented. We counted study groups in 60 different countries. These are, again, uh, uh, groups that were actually physically getting together to um, uh, discuss the materials in the course. Uh, and, and numerous use cases from all around the world that, uh, once again, very heartening to see. Uh, there was a Peace Corps volunteer in Mongolia who got together a group of about 30 students in Mongolia to help them take the course and work together with them as they were taking uh, the course. Uh, I had probably a, a half dozen faculty members from other universities contact me and say they were having their students take my course and then having them meet and discuss the course during their normal class time. Uh, and I figure if there were six who contacted me, there's probably many more who did, it who, who did not contact me about them doing that. Uh, and I can go on and on in terms of the various use cases, but uh, that geographic breadth is just quite amazing with these books. It's, it makes it a very exciting topic to, I think, not just discuss and hear about, but really to be part of its evolution, you know, being a pioneer. How does one develop a MOOC course? Uh, can you take us through this journey as briefly as you can, but as comprehensively as you need? Yeah, well, uh, once again, in my case, I had developed a set of lecture materials, um, basically PowerPoint slides uh, that I had developed over the years. And those became the backbone of my course. And so the first phase was recording those, uh, those lectures. I have to say it was an interesting experience. Uh, I'm someone, uh, kind of prides myself of being somewhat dynamic in the classroom, running up and down the aisles and the like. So being forced to videotape a lecture in which I had to keep my feet planted in front of the camera, uh, uh, I had no audience there, uh, was, was a challenge. Um, but uh, I think it, it came out OK. We were pleased with it. Uh, and, and so the creation of those videos really became, once again, the backbone of the MOOC. Uh, for the synchronous-based courses like Coursera, uh, we then created additional materials to really fill out the course. Um, one of the things we did was create a series of uh, multiple choice exams. Uh, they find that students, when they view the videos, if they are given an exam immediately after, it really helps reinforce the learning. Uh, it's one of the things that a MOOC can do that is can be done in a classroom environment, but it's a little more challenging to have that type of real-time feedback. So we created a series of those. We also created some uh, debrief videos, as I called them, where I would talk about and reflect on those week's learnings, actually using uh, discussion forums that we had created to provide information uh, for my own responses, to respond to student questions, to try to personalize the course a little bit. Uh, it probably goes without saying, when you have 90,000 students in a course, uh, you're not answering every email. Uh, in fact, I told the students right at the beginning that I won't be responsive to email because it would just be overwhelming to, to do so. Sure. So you try the best you can to, uh, like I said, keep it personal, to relate to the students and try to reflect on their learnings that you see, uh, especially through the discussion forums as you, as you, take, the, as you take the course. Uh, and then the final piece of my course was a final project. I, I elected to do a final project, which is a little more challenging than a final exam might be, either a multiple choice or a problem set. Um, but I thought it was important for the type of course it was and for them to really get the learnings of the course to do a final project. And so they were asked to do a strategic analysis of an organization of their choosing. Uh, many chose large public firms that you, you might see in the daily press. Uh, I had quite a few students who themselves were entrepreneurs and small business owners who were taking the course to help improve their strategy for their firm. And so they did their final projects on their uh, own organizations. And then finally, we set up a relationship uh, with a group called Corsol. Uh, as a new startup themselves, who has this, I think, brilliant idea that we can leverage MOOCs and projects like this to provide, in essence, pro bono work for needy organizations. So we had a number of social entrepreneurs and ventures who signed on to the course and then solicited students to do their final projects on their organizations. And so there was, an, in essence, a kind of a, a, a client relationship for the students who decided to work with those uh, companies and organizations. Uh, and uh, some really positive feedback from uh, the experience on both the student side and the organization side who elected to, to use it in that way. Pretty eclectic student body. Absolutely. Possibility. 
Well, that's that's just uh, that's just wonderful news. Uh, how would you say your experience with MOOCs has impacted the way you approach and deliver uh, courses and lectures in the traditional classroom, if if any? So, uh, you know, my bias is, I, once again, I come from Darden, which is uh, one of the few kind of pure case method schools. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been very clear to everyone that what you see in the MOOC is not what we do in the classroom. Uh, once again, the classroom, this is a facilitated conversation with the students based on a case reading for the day. Uh, I try to replicate the case environment in my MOOC, especially my Coursera MOOC, by having the students read cases that discuss them on the discussion forums. And what I've been telling everyone is, at some ways, the discussion forums exceeded my expectations. Uh, but I had very low expectations for what to get out of those discussion forums. The best comments that are posted uh, actually rivaled what I'd see in the Darden MBA classroom. Uh, the way these discussion forums work is there's often, there is a way to vote up the best responses. So what you see then is almost a crowdsourcing of the best ideas and best comments rising to the top of the discussion forums. And once again, those were excellent. We saw a very skewed distribution in participation in the, those discussion forums. Uh, for example, uh, out of 90,000 students, we might get a few thousand who were actively participating in the boards and posting. Uh, and once again, a very skewed distribution. Uh, a lot of what I'd like to call discussion room voyeurs who were there reading the posts. We actually knew if they were reading posts, uh, but never posting themselves. So what's missing? Uh, in a case-based classroom, a large part of the magic is the exchanges you get going in the classroom between students. And it's that real time pushing one another on various concepts, ideas. Uh, we talk about being decision oriented, that students are being forced in the classroom environment to state an opinion and defend that opinion in real time as others are arguing against them. Uh, there might be a future where the technology allows us to do that online. It, it, it's not there. Not there, now. Not there right now. Uh, and, I, and I do think it's one of the limitations of, uh, of MOOCs. Now, the good news is, I think, for residentially based uh, universities, is it tells us where our value add is. Uh, I, I've been uh, saying somewhat tongue in cheek, uh, lecturing is dead. And by that I mean not lecturing in its pure form, but lecturing where a faculty member stands in a classroom with 30 students or even 300 students in a classroom. Uh, the reasons are obvious. It is just way too easy now to video record that, create it in maybe even more dynamic ways and make it available to students when they want to consume that. Uh, and, and as a result, where universities, I think, need to move towards is the type of kind of high engagement uh, that, that we've been doing in Darden for 50 years. The, the Stanford professors who start Coursera uh, talk quite a bit about this idea of flipping the classroom, spending your time in the classroom, not on lecturing, but on these types of engaged learning environments. And so I joke, you know, Darden's been flipping the classroom for, for 50 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think that's where residential education is going to have to go because, it's, once again, it's just way too easy to create lecture materials and post them online, uh, and, uh, and and then share them with you know share them with the world. Yeah. Well, and, and you've, you've hit on some really good points as it relates to the value of MOOCs and um, and their technological disruption capability. But I think back to AACSB because that's where I work and. Uh, I think about assurance of learning, and, I, and I'm really okay with MOOCs and basic knowledge acquisition, but then when we start to get to the area of, of application of the knowledge, I'm falling short on that assurance yeah. of learning. And that doesn't mean they don't have a place, and, and they have a lot of excellent contributions, but uh, we'll have to see if technology can solve that challenge long term. When I, when I think about what a course offers, uh, either in a MOOC or in a residential uh, environment, I think of three things. Dissemination of knowledge, facilitation and exchange, and then assessment and feedback. When it comes to dissemination, I think this is where the MOOCs are strongest. Uh, the ability to, once again, take lectures, uh, even embody them in, in new and, and interesting ways uh, and, and really powerful learning ways. So this is where the MOOCs are the, are the strongest. And online education in general can be, be quite strong. As I was just discussing, you know, the facilitation piece, uh, technology is, is allowing us to do more and more, but it's not replicating what you can achieve in a classroom. And, and I think there's a couple fundamental limits to it. To do what we do in the Darwin classroom, it has to be synchronous. It can't be asynchronous. And I'm not convinced it's scalable. 
At Darden, we cap our classes at about 65 to 70 students. I find as an instructor, as a professor, any more than that, it is very hard to keep everyone engaged. Uh, yes, you know, there are days where I will get all 70 students to participate in a case discussion. Uh, you add a few more than that, and, and it's, it's very hard to do so. Uh, so there's some real technical limits, I think, on what we can do on the facilitation side online. The third piece is assessment. And uh, I have to share, this was probably the biggest pain point for me in my MOOC uh, experience. Um, uh, Thomas Jefferson, a founder of the University of Virginia, had a philosophy uh, that there should be no degrees. There, there should not even be you know, course credit given, uh, that universities are there for lifelong learning. Uh, it's a romantic ideal, uh, one I actually really like, maybe not a reality that we can enjoy here in universities. Um, but at its best, the MOOC works well as a lifelong learning opportunity. When people are literally taking the course for their own edification, maybe in my course, uh, for example, they're trying to improve their own business or their own venture. Uh, that's wonderful. But not surprisingly, a large number of people taking the course were interested in the accreditation piece, the credit piece of this. Now, again, all we gave was a statement of accomplishment. Uh, so this wasn't college credit in any way. I would be really hesitant to give credit similar to what we give in the Darden classroom for what my MOOC does, for the various reasons we discussed already and some of the limitations. But clearly that's where a lot of this is moving and a lot of people are trying to figure out. I think there's a couple of, of uh, limits to assessment at this point. Uh, one is uh, when you do more qualitative work like we did in, in the Foundations of Strategy course, I am not able as an instructor to grade all those exams or, or grade all of those uh, uh, papers. Uh, so anything that cannot be aut automated uh, requires some other solution. The solution that most MOOCs have been experimenting with is the idea of peer evaluation. So peer evaluation, you take an a analysis, you then submit it to five of your peers who then grade your assignment. Coursera, among others, talks about that in their uh, um, data that they've collected, that there is a fairly actually high correlation between faculty grading and peer assessment. And just anecdotally looking at my own course, I think that might actually be, be accurate. Uh, the part that's missing is the variance. Uh, there's incredible variance on the peer assessment. And as an individual student, as you can imagine, that's what you care about. Right? You care about that you've got five lousy reviewers yeah. who gave you no feedback and gave you terrible grades because they were just quickly trying to get through the peer assessment. So while some students had excellent peer assessors who gave voluminous feedback, very good quality feedback, there are others who did not receive it. And so that's a, that's a real tension point. If you want to do anything beyond a multiple choice or a problem set that can be automated, how do we do the assessment piece? The second piece, which uh, Coursera and others are working very hard on, and I think making progress, is issues around academic integrity, um, questions around plagiarism and cheating on exams and the like. Uh, I know in my course there was a lot of discussion in the forums about um, instances of plagiarism on uh, analyses, and very hard to, to try to address in these, in these formats. Uh, one of the things I know Coursera is working on is actually using video recognition. So most people's computers these days obviously have video cameras. When you sit down, it could actually verify that you are the one sitting there doing the keystrokes. Uh, so there are ways in which the technology is trying to address it, but it, it's not there right now. So I think that assessment piece, um, there's, there's hope, but there's a long way to go, I think, until uh, on, a, on a massive scale we're going to see the willingness to give credit even though that's where I, clearly the industry is trying to push it. Even, even with the video, there are probably ways around that. But, <laughs> but we, we can't underestimate the excitement that active minds such as myself that are nearing retirement are, are thinking in the potential of, of MOOCs to keep that mind active uh, uh, after we're done working day to day. So I, I think they're, they, they really have potential uh, uh, byproduct benefits beyond Absolutely. the original attention. So let's move into some questions on the impact of MOOCs uh, as they're having on higher education. Uh, from your observations and perhaps experiences, uh, how have MOOCs changed or even have they changed higher education? Uh, for instance, how is the university's role in student educational development uh, and uh, maturation changed? Um, has the role of a professor changed? 
so I think it's you know still very early stages. Uh, um, you know, we're, we're as some have observed, we're kind of on the, maybe the peak and now even the downturn of the hype, uh, hyperbole uh, uh, curve here, where much has been written about the end of universities and uh, and the like. And I, I believe that is all hi hyperbole here. Um, so I think it remains to be seen what the uh, the impact will be. I, I do think it is a potential disruption to. Uh, higher education in general, uh, and we can talk more about how that might uh, play out. Um, I do think, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to force faculty who are maybe more lecture-based to think of other ways to engage uh, students in the classroom beyond just lecturing. I think that will be potentially a transformative experience. And the technology itself, I think, opens up really interesting opportunities in a complementary way to uh, how we improve our, our educational offerings. Um, one uh, provider, uh, Newton, another interesting company out there who's providing solutions for universities rather than having their own platform that's out there and, and highly visible, uh, has some really interesting ways in which by using the large numbers of students going through, let's say, an online module, they can very precisely uh, begin to develop and manipulate those materials to meet specific student needs. So take a uh, freshman introductory to math class and you're going through that course and suddenly they recognize that you keep getting the same types of problems wrong. Maybe it's that you really don't understand natural logs well. And so then they can give you remedial educational materials to help you improve yeah. your natural, your understanding of natural logs. And so that, in essence, customization of uh, uh, education uh, can really be enabled by online. So I think there's incredible opportunities for some complementarity between what we do in the classroom and how we can leverage technology to, uh, to improve that, um, that we'll see you know, hopefully more and more in the future. Great, great diagnostics and an ability to make up for that first miss in the classroom lecture. You can go back to it and, and learn. But I, I, I use this cartoon in one of the presentations I make that um, uh, that, that has these parents looking concerned and their, their son comes to, the, to them and, and says that, look, I've just downloaded my education. And I, and it always, I always think, well, what would happen if society came to the point where an 18-year-old went down into the basement, that wouldn't be here in Florida, but, uh, and four years later came out with a degree? Uh, I, have a, I just have a built-in maybe because of my uh, age fear of that environment, especially when I see the propensity of younger people to do everything through their fingers and less through their, their oral capabilities. Uh, so I, I, I don't know, what, what, are, what are your thoughts? Do, do you ever see higher education becoming, becoming just so um, uh, mechanical that, it, that it's, uh, uh, it, it has a large number of these providers online? Yeah, I, I think when I, when I talk to, to students about what do you get out of, let's say, an MBA education, but I think this applies more generally, um, at one level you get a set of analytical skills. Um, and uh, those uh, analytical skills, maybe it's calculating the net present value of an investment, like, you know, those might lend themselves fairly well to an online environment. Uh, there's a set of social skills. Uh, and by that I mean things like leadership, teamwork, um, uh, communication skills and the like. Uh, and, and those, perhaps, an online environment, but there's a lot to be said for a residential education in, in honing these. But there's a third level uh, of education that I think we, we don't maybe recognize uh, often enough, which, for lack of a better term, I often refer to as an integrative capability. And, and this is the higher order uh, learning and higher order capacity that we're really trying to instill in our students. This is why we do the case method. It's being able to deal with ambiguity and uncertainty in real time, lift limited data. How do you make decisions? Uh, there might not be a right or wrong decisions, but there are better ones than others, and how do you justify them? That, that type of analysis is, is complex, and uh, that can't be done through a multiple choice exam. That can't necessarily be done through, through just a pure lecture. Um, and, and I think that's, once again, where the real value of a residential education is the real value of a liberal arts education, this idea of the analytical mind and, uh, and, and the like. Uh, so I, I, there, there's always going to be a role for residential education. Where I think we're going to see some interesting developments is I could foresee a bifurcation in higher ed and MBA programs and business programs as well. There is so much concern, rightfully, about the cost of higher ed. 
and the escalations in the cost of the higher ed. And, and largely, I think this is a byproduct of the race by institutions to move up the, the kind of the value chain, or excuse me, move up the, uh, the pecking order of, of universities and, and colleges. And so we spend more and more to have more and more amenities and more and more uh, you know, world-class faculty and the like to, to compete. Um, at some point, there will be a credible uh, online degree, maybe offered by an existing residential university, maybe not, maybe some new player, maybe a Coursera or the like, that there will be a decision calculus that parents and students will have to make where they'll say, I can get an all-in, let's say, undergraduate degree for $10,000 or I can do a traditional residential program for 40,000, or maybe you know, far more, obviously, for a lot of universities. At some point, they're gonna make the switch. And what I think that means is that we'll again have this kind of bifurcation. And I think for schools kind of lower on the pecking order, this is quite dangerous to them. Because uh, I think it's gonna be harder to justify a premium um, price for a non-differentiated educational degree. The, the Harvards and the Stanfords and the Whartons of the world, they're going to be fine. There's always going to be a high premium to be paid for uh, an elite residential university education. Uh, if anything, this world might actually raise the prices for those because of, uh, they'll be even more desirable to get in. Um, but I would think at some level we would have a kind of mass producer, large number uh, university step up and really go after you know, the online, the online market. We're, we're already starting to see that. Liberty University nearby us at University of Virginia now has 100,000 students online uh, in addition to their residential students. Arizona State has expressed their interest of being uh, over 100,000 students. I think once you start to reach those levels, you know, why not a million? Um, from a business standpoint, higher ed is very interesting in that no one has a uh, dominant market share. No one even has a measurable market share. Um, Where's our kind of our Toyota, uh, the one who kind of has a highly efficient, low cost education for the masses? Uh, I think that strategic opportunity is there and the technology is allowing for someone to step into that. Now, I think the interesting question, two interesting questions with that. First, uh, who is going to be the likely winner of that type of battle? Well, once again, going back to other industries and looking at other shakeouts, uh, there's lots of evidence that it's often a new entrant into the industry. It is not the established incumbents who make the big change to the new technology. But there are instances where that does occur. Um, so it wouldn't be surprising that it might even be something we don't know about yet who was able to make that play. Um, the, the, the second thing is what is the response of those who see this kind of wave coming to them? Um, and, and how far does this kind of bubble up? You know, there's uh, I think 2,500 uh, uh, four-year colleges, universities and colleges in the United States. Uh, is it going to be 2,500 universities in the future? Is it going to be 200? Is it going to be 20 residential universities in the future? That remains to be seen. Uh, but the challenging part is if you're one of those universities who all finds themselves under threat from this kind of mass uh, education, what's your response? What do you do? And, and I think that's, that's a big question for a lot of, a lot of universities out there. Well, one university not too far away from the state of uh, Florida, I understand, has launched a, an online MBA for about $6,500, which is about the same as I paid for my uh, 1975 AMC Pacer. Uh, <laughs> but it wasn't terribly functional, and I think it's a buyer beware market. Well, yeah. was, they still have to be proved. Getting the price point down is one thing, but the efficacy of the degree is something quite Absol more important long term. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's where this will still play out. And it will play out over not just a couple years. This is going to play out over decades. Um, and so I think it's going to, like I said, it's going to be a long shakeout if there is one. Yes, so the institutions are strong. Creating and delivering a MOOC requires significant resources on the part of the school, including uh, technological enhancements, uh, faculty training, support staff, et cetera. Uh, yet in most cases, these courses are delivered uh, at no cost to the students. Yeah. So where then is the incentive for a university to become involved in MOOC delivery? Yeah, this is a great question. I think it's a million dollar question that most universities are, are dealing with right now. I've seen estimates of anywhere up to 50,000 plus to develop just one MOOC course. And that doesn't include faculty time and effort. That's just the production costs of creating a MOOC. 
Uh, in the short time that we've seen these MOOCs be popularized, the production values have increased greatly uh, and, and continue to, to uh, enhance. I look at the videos we did for my MOOC, which was, once again, a little less than two years ago, about 18 months ago, uh, and it already feels dated in terms of the state of the art and what some groups are doing. Uh, so that's just raising those costs uh, even further. Uh, a lot of it's going to come down to what's the strategy of the university. Uh, again, for kind of the elite residential universities, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be a mass producer selling education at the same time. Um, the same way that you know, BMW doesn't necessarily want to sell a Kia. Uh, th there are reasons that you know, different uh, organizations choose to specialize and differentiate in different ways. Uh, and part of the uh, elite university's uh, appeal is their selectivity. Um, so why would they play in this space? Well, for one, it could be brand recognition. Uh, you know, yeah. My argument for my course is that this is a great way, as we push a globe, have a global push at Darden, to try to get uh, awareness of Darden and the University of Virginia to a global audience. Um, so that is one, uh, one reason. It is also just part of our educational mission. Uh, and so to have these resources, why not make them freely available? I think that was MIT's original uh, um, uh, belief in their, in their program was uh, it's not going to harm our residential-based educational experience to make these freely available, and it provides a public good to uh, a wide variety of people who might not otherwise have access to, to higher ed. So at one level, it could be about branding and awareness and, and, and a public good that's provided. There will be, obviously, revenue opportunities. Uh, I think what we're starting to see is specialization. Uh, it might be a particular program. Maybe a specialty that your university is, is world class at that, that you then focus on and develop materials there. Um, lots of different models in terms of, once again, is it a, is it a degree program? Is it a, a kind of what we call an executive education program? Um, lots of different mixes and models out there that I think are continuing to evolve. And then, like I said, for some universities, they're going to make the big play. They might say, you know, we want to be a mass online uh, provider. But again, it's, it's, it's high fixed cost, low variable cost market. Um, I, I don't see every university having a wide number of MOOCs available. It's just the finances don't make sense. The, the revenue models don't make sense for that to occur. So I think you're going to see a lot of specialization in choosing. For a lot of universities, they might be a decision whether to consume MOOCs rather than to generate them as a way to lower their cost, their cost structure. Well, the Charlottesville Chamber of Commerce has got to love it. <laughs> We're seeing uh, other companies emerging as a result of the popularity of, of MOOCs and beyond Coursera and Udacity and some others. But for example, this one I love, MOOC to degree helps students attain transferable academic credit uh, toward a, a degree by participating in universities uh, upon su successfully completing a MOOC to degree course. I understand the former uh, governor of uh, the state of Florida, uh, Jeb Bush likes MOOC to degree. That's what they tell me. With more of these types of companies and potentially new MOOC providers appearing, uh, now, now do you think that this will uh, affect universities' education delivery, um, maybe more en masse, and, and how might the, the student admission process to a degree or college be impacted? I understand MOOC to degree is post-admission, but but what do you think that's uh, going to be impacted? Yeah, I think that, you know, the first interesting observation is we, we talk about these big players like Coursera and edX and uh, Udacity. But I'm observing uh, hundreds of little startups that are specializing in various pieces of the puzzle. Um, I mentioned Coursal before, you know, specializing in the matching process between um, projects and, and, in essence, clients and organizations to work with. Uh, another uh, um, company uh, is actually a Darden graduate. Uh, is called Learning Jar, and Learning Jar is, in essence, moving downstream, looking at what do employers need in terms of skill set verification, and so they're providing, in essence, um, modules that allow people to go and get the education wherever it might be. You know, residential, it might be online, it might even be an autodidact who just you know teaches themselves. But then there's an assessment and verification process. For employers afterwards. Um, so what we could see is the vertical disintegration of the assessment and accreditation piece from the university piece. I'm sure it may be a concern for, for you all and, uh, and for others as well. 
Um, whether that will occur or not, it's, it remains to be seen. But there are clearly those players out there trying to, to pull that apart a little more than we've seen. And clearly we have these classic examples like uh, uh, the medical profession and the legal profession where there are things like the bar exam in addition to the, the degree completion. Um, and, and so I think it's going to be an interesting evolution here between those. But if we move more in that direction, um, that can make these MOOCs even more valuable to people who are kind of cobbling together degrees or certifications from a variety of different, different sources. Interesting. Well, uh, I'd like to move to the final uh, predetermined question because I know there are so many. We have more questions from the audience this time than, uh, than normal. So we're, we're going to jump to this capstone question from, uh, from our staff. We, yeah. we, we write the questions. I don't, but uh, <laughs> many do. Uh, this final question asks you to gaze into your crystal ball. Uh, what do you think higher education will look like in the future, 10, 20, even 30 years from today, in particular with advancements in technology and the things that we have discussed today? So uh, it's your chance to be a soothsayer here. <laughs> you mean it's a chance to be wrong, right? That's <laughs> well, <laughs> no one, by the time, no one will know. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so you know, going back to what I said earlier, I, I think uh, 20, 30 years from now, there, there will always be a role for elite residential education. And, and, and that's not going away. Um, and so I think uh, we will see, uh, you know, probably many of the leading institutions that currently exist today will be thriving 30 years from now. Um, you know, I, I've written before that if you look over the history of humankind, uh, the most persistent institutions, I think education may be, or universities in particular, may be second only to the church. Uh, many of the U US universities far outlive most governments around the world. Yes. Um, so th there, is a, there is a stability that universities bring that I think will, uh, they'll be fine for many you know, moving forward. Again, though, I do think there is a role for the technology, and the technology is evolving fast enough, and it seems that it has enough you know, kind of momentum right now that we're going to see credible online degrees offered at scale. And that's going to that's gonna have significant implications for like I said, those schools perhaps on the lower pecking order of the kind of the hierarchy of universities. Um, I've observed before though as well, uh, unlike other markets uh, and other shakeouts, there's not an active um, uh, exit market for universities. No. Uh, it, we see it every once in a while. We see some mergers and acquisitions. We see some go uh, basically close up shop, uh, but it's a painful process and a long and drawn out process. Um, and, and unfortunately, I think we're going to see some of that. We're going we're to see uh, that plane itself out. Once again, I think on a 20, 30 year time scale, we'll probably have fewer residential based uh, universities and colleges in moving into the future. Um, and, and, and so I think uh, what the number will be, no one, no one knows. But I think it will be different than what, than what we see today in terms of that mix. Well, I, I heard a, what I thought was an authoritative number. Chairman of Google, Eric Schmidt, said there would be 10. <laughs> I said, OK, well, maybe that's a little bit too uh, aggressive. But all the points you raise are, are particularly accurate. Schools have to show value in their marketplace and continue to and build that. But the institution is strong, and the yeah. institution will not go away quickly. Absolutely. Well, uh, I'm very excited about the audience's questions. I always am, because they can say what they want. Uh, OK, this one says, I recently completed a Coursera MOOC as a student. While there were course materials, readings and videos, lectures by the professor, there was absolutely no feedback from a qualified reviewer. We each wrote an essay each week, and feedback came from peers in the class. Most of the feedback comments were completely worthless. How can we assess the progress of students in a MOOC course, or to use AACSB terminology, how can we guarantee assurance of learning? A lot of expectations in this question. Yeah, I mean, this, we touched upon this before again, and I'm in actually in agreement that I think the assessment piece for the MOOCs is going to be one of the uh, big limiting factors, in, especially in the short run, but maybe even in the long run, to how effective they are, and, and whether universities and others feel good about giving credit for people who go through these, these online courses. Uh, there are some ways to get around this uh, in terms of just uh, expensive, but you know, having teams of instructors who actually are able to do the assessment, these teams of graders, basically. Um, uh, 
so the, the, there are ways that you can kind of use old fashioned technology to try to solve some of these. And then, like I said, there are those who are pushing on the technology to try to improve the ability to, uh, to do automated assessment. And there's even those, I'm sure, who are pushing kind of artificial intelligence solutions for grading and the like. Uh, remains to be seen, remains to be seen. But I think that that is gonna be the sticking point for MOOCs in terms of accreditation and degrees is that is that assessment piece at scale, at scale. You know we can do it in small numbers, but at scale, that's yeah. a big a big challenge. Very interesting. Okay, the next question is, what is a viable strategic response to the rise of MOOCs? Uh, how can universities take advantage of them? And what risks do they take in, in doing uh, so? Uh, in other words, how are MOOCs uh, a barrier and an opportunity uh, to achieving the goals of higher education? So if we, if we go back to my uh, thesis, hypothesis perhaps, that uh, we might see um, uh, the bottom of the market basically getting gobbled up by a mass consolidator using online technology. What would be the strategic response? So I think there's really two ways to go. One would be uh, really find a, a differentiated niche, you know, satisfy a certain portion of a student population. Uh, maybe it's, it's based on a certain topic matter or a certain delivery vehicle, experiential school or the like. Uh, could be one way to go. Um, the other way, and I actually fear this a little bit, is that you will see a large number of schools in kind of the mid-tier, as they have been trying, but even double down on their attempts to, to rise to the elite tier. It's a natural response here to kind of avoid uh, the undifferentiated masses by becoming an elite differentiated player, uh, let's say an MBA education. What that means is that they're going to invest more. They're going to try to double down in terms of amenities and the like. And all of these are the things that have been driving the cost up for higher ed uh, over the last 20, 30 years already. Um, so. Uh, Another prediction may or may not pan out, but I actually wouldn't be surprised if we see university costs actually go up in the near future as more and more schools try to uh, uh, emblemate, uh, uh, um, resemble the elite top schools in the in the uh, the field, uh, and 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 spend their way to it to achieve that. Um, we already see this in the college athletics, right? Uh, you know, the number of schools now who want a world class football program or basketball program and are trying to spend to do that. Um, and, and that's a shame because that's just going to drive the cost up and probably make this whole process even faster because, again, that differential between an online degree cost and a, uh, a residential degree could get wider and wider quickly. So, well, in the end, the market is going to decide what type of product and quality that it, that it wants in graduates. Uh, one viewer from South Korea writes, I sense that any school contemplating starting a MOOC will take on significant startup and subsequent operating costs in order to be effective and valuable, as you described. Uh, in aggregate, these local costs undermine the MOOC's much touted cost saving potential. But what are your thoughts? Well, I, I would agree with that. I think this gets back to, again, that um, uh, how, many, how many foundations of business strategy courses do we need? Uh, now, clearly, I, I don't have the, you know, the only or the best one. I mean, there could be others out there. But five, 10, you know, at, at some point, um, we've got that space kind of covered right. and, and, uh, and, and we don't need 100 or 200 or especially 2,000 foundations of business strategy uh, courses out there. And, and so uh, I think that's the decision that universities are going to have to make is where is it worthwhile for us to play? Where can we be world class and know that it's going to be a small numbers game in those, in those places? Um, the other question, again, that I think a lot of universities are going to have to ask is when do we consume these online materials and MOOCs? When do we feel comfortable having our students take a course in essence from a professor from another university? Um, that's where the real cost savings come in, of course. Um, but there's obvious you know, questions about quality and, 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 and just your own brand and the like if you're engaging in that uh, type of behavior. So I, I think that's, that's gonna be an interesting decision calculus for a lot of schools. Well, MOOCs are not for everyone and, and may not be suitable for all learning styles. We've, we've talked about that. But do you think MOOC delivery has the potential to replace traditional learning? Uh, some of these you've already covered at some uh, effect, so it, it, it's not terribly important to go into too much detail. But uh, how can they be tweaked to better address uh, the preference and needs of students who learn better in a traditional classroom? 
Well, I think, you know, the first point again is that residential education is not going away. Uh, so I think there will always be demand for residential education. And so that, uh, that I think we, we can feel good about. Um, uh, in terms of tweaking it, I think it's all the challenges we've already talked about. How do we create an environment that is, uh, uh, allows for the facilitation, for the assessment, uh, for the rich discussions that can take place in a, as a residential classroom? And um, I don't know if it will ever get there, but I think there's a lot of people now working on trying to make the technology do, do, that, do that better. And like I said, there are instances where we can actually see the technology uh, might do a better job than what we can do in a, in a traditional uh, classroom setting. Um, and this gets back to this point again about, you know, how will the market for higher education evolve? There will be, um, you know, opportunities for differentiations for schools that might say, you know, being really small and being really focused on maybe uh, high touch or uh, um, uh, mentoring and the like um, will be there. Um, now, there might be questions, and I think more um, disconcerting might be access questions. And that's something I think... Uh, the MOOCs have been touted as a, uh, an opportunity for greater access to higher ed. Uh, but if you believe my story, it could also mean that those who have traditionally been going to residential ed uh, schools will start, some will start to migrate to online. And is there something lost there uh, in the exchange? Could be. Uh, a viewer in Malaysia asks, what advice would you give uh, smaller uh, less known institutions of higher education, especially those in emerging regions, to become involved uh, with MOOCs and, and other forms of open learning? Well, I think, again, you know, the first question is there might be consumption opportunities where you leverage the MOOCs to offer courses uh, that you might not otherwise be able to staff at your universities. That's an attractive opportunity, a way to maybe create efficiencies and cost savings. Um, and then look for opportunities for differentiation. You know, one that comes to mind for, uh, for any number of, of non-U.S. speaking, uh, excuse me, non-English speaking uh, schools is, uh, is that translational aspect. Um, there are a few now starting to arise MOOCs that are not English. There's a couple uh, Spanish language and French language ones. Uh, but it's a big world out there, and there's lots of opportunity to create material specific to a particular uh, language and people. Um, and that customization, I think, is uh, we'll see more and more of that. Well, from the Lion City, a very big question. Uh, we find MOOCs to be an opportunity for educators and, more importantly, uh, for students' independent learning via networking with students worldwide. Uh, MOOCs can help foster networking opportunities between students uh, and educators, I would think, develop course materials and encourage collaboration and social learning. Uh, do you foresee MOOCs being utilized by universities as a tool for partnering with each other uh, through collaboration in teaching methods, uh, learning strategies, course modules, and, and other areas of emphasis, research? I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, again, given the kind of fixed costs in developing a MOOC, uh, partnering with a group of players to strategically decide, you know, hey, we'll develop this module and this module, you do these others, and then we'll bring, you know, bring them together into whatever it might be, a degree program or the like, um, makes a lot, of, a lot of sense. Um, I'll give you one quick anecdote, uh, and this goes back actually about eight years. So this isn't a MOOC question, but it is an online opportunity. Uh, I had a, a, a doctoral seminar um, that I was offering when I was at Duke with another faculty member. We ended up uh, partnering with Bocconi University and using telepresence to simultaneously run the seminar with doctoral students in Bocconi and at Duke at the same time. And for something like doctoral seminars, which tend to be very small numbers of students, not very efficient in terms of, of faculty time and, and resources, uh, this was wonderful. It allowed us to build a much larger cohort of students taking the seminar. And it allowed for the faculty members to split time between their, their partners. And it allowed us to actually uh, enhance the breadth of the exposure and learning experiences the students have because they were being exposed to these different faculty members. Um, so that's just one example of kind of leveraging technology to bring together cohorts of students that you wouldn't otherwise uh, be able to do so. So I think absolutely there's opportunities for collaboration between universities for uh, doing, in essence, kind of online exchange programs with students, creating materials in a collaborative way so they don't have duplicative effort um, and the like. It's a lot of potential. Everything you've said uh, says to me that 
that MOOCs and online delivery are, are a very strong tool in the toolkit, yeah. uh, but it doesn't replace the toolbox. And, and that's, we have to use multiple forms of education delivery, uh, academic uh, interaction uh, to make for a high quality educational experience for our students. Absolutely. Very complimentary to a lot Very of the things we already do. All right. And this is the last question from our audience. A viewer from New Zealand asks, what role can, could, or do MOOCs play in delivering business education? Are some courses better suited to delivery via MOOCs over others? Yeah, I think uh, there's, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence emerging that that is definitely the case. Uh, lots of efforts to offer courses that are maybe more qualitative or discursive in nature. Clearly, the, the history of these MOOCs, and it's not that long of a history, but uh, more quantitative courses, the computer science courses and the like, lend themselves very well, I think mainly because of the assessment piece. Because you know, if you can do a problem set or a multiple choice exam, you can do the assessment fairly well. The second you get into more uh, critical thinking skills, very hard to do, to do the assessment. Um, so at least where the technology is now, I, I definitely do think there are certain courses that lend themselves better to it, make themselves more likely to be ones we'd be willing to give college credit for and degrees, and there'll be others that are gonna be a little more challenging for all the reasons that we've, uh, that we've discussed. Well, Mike, thank you so thank much. You much. You've done a, a great job. I'm afraid that your compensation for doing this is that your email volume will go up, not down. <laughs> but it, you've done a wonderful job uh, introducing us more formally to the brave new world of MOOCs. Uh, uh, they're, they're very exciting. I know as one who champions lifelong learning, uh, I think they're a consistent enabler. Um, I, I kind of remember the entrance of uh, the McDonald's approach to hamburgers and others in the early 1960s. Uh, and when I still eat McDonald's, uh, I have to tell you, I prefer Fuddruckers. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I think we're, we're going to always need higher education yeah. in its more uh, developed, comprehensive, adaptable sense to further the development of business. So uh, it's a great tool, but um, uh, I would hasten to think that it's, it's going to be uh, a tool and not necessarily the machine long term. I agree. But we'll see. We, we can argue about that for a long time. I want to thank you, our, our viewing global audience, uh, for joining us on this episode of ENL with Professor Michael Lennox of the University of Virginia's Darden School. Uh, it was a great discussion um, to celebrate ENL's two year anniversary. I think it was a very poignant discussion uh, and will surely uh, uh, set the tone for our, uh, our future episodes. Please join us again in November for the next broadcast of VNL. Uh, be sure to visit our website for further information on this and a now a growing library of previous uh, episodes whose subject matter is still quite relevant. Thank you and have a great day.